Bibles to Matthew, the seventh chapter. Matthew, the seventh chapter. Do you know the beautiful thing about God's word? It, it is a living word. Amen. You cannot take it as concrete as, um, well, who's that name? Danielle Steele. You know, I mean, you, it is what it is, but God's word is living. It helps us to change. See, Danielle Steele won't help you to change. She gives you ideas how to murder. God gives you a way to life. Amen. Amen. But I was sitting up here, and then God gave me something else to, um, to put in there and take out something. That's how beautiful God is when we are close to him. Amen. If you have Matthew, the seventh chapter, please say amen. amen. We will be beginning with the first verse, and this is the words of Jesus, not only because it's in red, but it's because he said so. Judge not that you be not judged. For with the judgment you pronounce, you will be judged. And with the measure you use it, will be measured to you. Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when there is a gigantic log in your own eye. You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye. And then you will see clearly to take the speck out of your brother's eye. Do not give dogs what is holy. And do not throw your pearls before swine. Lest they trample them underfoot and turn and attack you. Amen. Let us pray. Most holy and all wise Father God, Lord, we just praise your name this morning just for who you are. And Lord, you said that you are God and beside you there is no other. And we thank you, Father. Thank you, Lord, for opening yourself up to us, Lord, that we accepted you as our Lord and our Savior. Thank you, Father, for building us day by day, hour by hour, second by second, oh God. Letting us know, Lord, that we have to work on ourselves every day and not just work on ourselves in a way that we want to. But that we must follow every word that is in the word of God, that we may be a living testimony to those around us. So I thank you, Father, on the behalf of these, your people, who decided to come out to church today, Lord. For, Lord, as we were on the road, we saw people going fishing. We saw people headed towards Virginia Beach to lay half naked on the beach and soak up some sun. But, Lord, your people decided to come here and soak up some word. And we thank you today for them, Father. Thank you for your presence this morning, O oh Lord. Thank you for our worship leader seeing, Lord, that the people must give your name praise. And she didn't rest until folks started giving God praise. We thank you, O oh God. Thank you, O oh Lord, for being a good God to us. Now, Lord, we come to the time that is most important. Yes, Lord, your word is more important than the songs we sing. It is more important, Lord, than doing, than picking up the money. It's more important, oh God, than cleaning up this place. Called. It is more important because it is what gives us life. It is what gives us direction. Now, I, your servant, oh Lord, ask, Lord, that you, Lord, if I'm not humble, humble me down. Lord, you tear me down where I'm so high and build me up where I'm weak, oh God, that I might be able to give your word to a people who are hungry for it, to a people who want to live. Lord, even this sermon that you've given me, oh God, if it is not what you want your people to have today, then Lord, you take over and you give to me what your people need, that they may live, that they may be a light, and more than anything, that they may be a delight to you, O oh God, in the name of Jesus. We praise you. We thank you for what you've done. And we're praising you right now for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Let every heart say amen. amen. I titled this sermon, Judging Others. This is part of the Back to Basics um, sermons that I, I believe that we should get back to basics and learn the simple things. And that way we can grow into learning more deeper things about God. But judgment is one thing that people do to folk in the church, and not only in the church, but after they leave the church. And we need to hear what God's word says about it. But before I get started, let me tell you a true story. 
We sometimes criticize others unfairly. We don't know all their circumstances, nor do we know their motives. Only God, who is aware of all the facts, is able to judge people righteously. John Wesley, great preacher from the 1700s, uh, told of a man he had little respect for because he considered the man to be miserly, that means, and covetous. That means he had money but wouldn't give it to the church or wouldn't give it out. And so he, one day, this person contributed just a small amount to charity. And Wesley, like most preachers, rebuked this man in front of the congregation, criticizing him. After the incident, the man came up to Wesley and told him that he had been living on parsnips and water for seven weeks. He explained that before his conversion, he had run up many bills. Now, by skimping on everything and buying nothing for himself, he was paying off his creditors one by one. The man said, Christ has made me an honest man. And so with all these debts to pay, I can only give a few offerings above my tax. I must settle up with my worldly neighbors and show them what the grace of God can do in the heart of a man who was once dishonest. Wesley, feeling bad, apologized to the man and asked for his forgiveness. You ever been called to jury duty? <laughs> ever been asked to make a judgment about a matter? Some Christians seem to feel that they are on permanent jury duty. Jesus addressed this fact in his final leg of the Sermon on the Mount. Twelve members of a jury acquitted Andrea Yates, if y'all can remember her, of the murder of her children in the bathtub by reason of insanity. However you may feel about it, that jury was sitting in a place of judgment. And when you hear their verdict, undoubtedly, you make a judgment of your own. O.J. Simpson, the same thing. Saddam Hussein, the same thing. So what do we believe about this direct command in Matthew 7, 1, judge not? In context, comparing scripture with scripture, what is the true interpretation of Jesus' words here? This is very misunderstood stuff. And many Christians overuse and they abuse the words, don't judge me, in all their circumstances. Judge not does not mean that it is wrong to judge doctrine, to see if that doctrine is of God. The word of God is our final authority, and we are to base our doctrinal beliefs on, not on our own feelings, or not on our own experience, or what is widely accepted and politically correct. We all have feelings and experiences, but they must pass the test of scrutiny when they are laid beside the word of God. The Bible, time and time again, warns us not to believe everything we hear just because we hear it from a preacher or a church or a ministry. I want you to know today that there are some ministers out there today who are preaching the untruths about the Bible. They're preaching things that God never intended for a preacher to be even saying from the pulpit. Don't believe a person just because he has a large congregation and a lot of followers because just like rock and roll singers, those followers are just blindly following the blind. I want you to know today that God gave you the right. He gave you the strength. He gave you his word so that you would be able to interpret what is right and what is wrong with that person saying it. God never intended for a man to get behind the pulpit and shame you into giving him money. God never intended for the church to be given a pastor, a brand new Rolls Royce. God never intended for the church to pay for his rich wife or his big 16 bedroom house. God never called for these things. So it is your right to put that up to question, to question if this man of God or is he of the devil? Because there's only two. There is no middle ground. 
but the church being as gullible, gullible as it is will follow anything that has a call around his neck and stands behind a pulpit and we got to stop being gullible the Bible tells us to be wise in our decisions, wise in who we follow, wise in what we're pouring into our spirit. Because what we pour into our spirit will eventually pour out. And what pours out must be of God and not of man. Can't believe everything we hear. The Apostle Paul in Romans 16 chapter says, Now I beseech you, brethren, Mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrine which you have learned, and avoid them. You hear what I said? Uh, I said it was, was it in the Bible. Yeah. It's in your Bible too. Yeah. Is it really? Yeah. Is it in your Bible too? The Bible says to avoid them. But what do the church do today? Just because they gave a few duckies in the church, just because they gave the church a gift, we follow them and act like they're God. We've got to get on God against everything that comes against. The Bible says right here in the scriptures to avoid them. The theme of America today, you've heard it everywhere. You hear it all in the news. You hear it all in the politician's mouth. You hear it on your job. Is we got to be tolerant. We're considered out of line if we don't put up with anything and everything that comes down the pipe. You see, I, I, I'll be put down if I go on Facebook and say that, that Caitlin is a fool. Who is Caitlin? She was once a man by the name of Bruce Jenner who got a sex change operation. And they call themselves Caitlin. And the world thinks I ought to keep my mouth shut or go along with the program. But I'm here to tell you, God never made a mistake when you were born a man or a woman. God never made a mistake when he says, don't fornicate. God never made a mistake when he says, don't commit adultery. God never made a mistake when he says that homosexuality is wrong. I will stand on God's word. I don't care what the world says. I am not tolerant of what goes against the will of my father. Put me in jail. I'll preach in jail too. Go ahead and whip me just like Paul because after I get out, I'm going to preach the same thing that I was preaching before you put me in there. I'm not afraid to be honest with folks. I'm not afraid to tell the truth. On my job, they say that I'm, that, that I'm uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, 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 I'm brutally honest. <laughs> brutally honest. Ain't, ain't that a shame? I can't even tell the truth. Uh, I'm brutally honest. Well, if that's the case, everybody that I've ever came in contact with says that I'm brutally honest. Even my wife says, might be saying, I'm brutally honest. Honey, does this look right on me? No, it don't look good on you. <laughs> and I don't care what the fuck out there say. I know it don't look good to me. I want it to look good. But I don't stop her from wearing what she wants to wear or doing what she wants to do. But saints, we've got to get this word out of the Christian's vocabulary. We cannot tolerate everything. The church has been too tolerant of what the world is telling us that we ought to do. The church is telling us to be quiet. The church, the world is saying that when we have prayer in our homes, that we have to keep the volume level down so we don't disturb Joe Blow next door or Sister Sue across the street. The world is telling us that we ought to go against the grain of God and be what they want us to be. When they ain't got it together themselves, how in the world am I going to follow? which is going to hell. Second John, the first chapter says these words, if there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, this truth, this word of God, receive him not into your house 
neither bid him God speak. So I want you to know today, don't invite the Jehovah's Witnesses in your house. I want you to know today, don't wish the Mormons, a.k.a. Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints well. Send them on their way. Because when you invite them in their house, you're agreeing to their doctrine. Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. Mormons don't believe that Jesus was the Son of God. I want you to know today that when you invite them in, you're saying that I agree with Jehovah. I agree with the Mormons. And I don't care what nobody say, but you better care what the Word of God says. And I tell them, Hebrews, the 13th chapter says, be not carried away with every diverse and strange doctrine. Ain't that what the church is doing today? Just because TD said it, it must be okay. Just because Joel says it, it must be okay. Just because Paula says it, it must be okay. But we, even if the pastor says it, you've got to put the pastor, Joel Osteen, T.D. Jakes, and Paula White against the word of God and see if what they're saying is the truth of God. And in fact, I want to tell you today that instead of you sitting down and accepting what somebody else has to say, why don't you open that Bible for yourself and study the word of God so that God can give it to you straight from the horse's mouth. We like to be spoon fed. We like to be like little babies. Why, 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 feed, feed, feed. Why, 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 feed, feed, feed. It's time for us to take the spoon for ourselves and feed ourselves the word of God. It's time for us to start getting strong. That's why we got so many weak Christians. Because you're listening to this one who's different from that one. And you're listening to that one who's different from this one. And pretty soon you're all mixed up. Not only are you mixed up about the spirit, but you're all mixed up in the head. You don't know what to believe. But God is the true God. He said, if you ask of me, I'll give it to you liberally. Just like I gave it to everybody else because I freely give to you the truth. Jesus is the answer. His word is the answer. Judge not does not mean that we cannot judge teachers and preachers to see if they are of God. Matthew 7 chapter, we heard it earlier. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravening wolves. I cannot obey this command without judging, and certainly I need God's help in making this kind of judgment. Sheep's clothing means they look like us, talk like us, praise like us, sing like us. They act like us. They're, they almost look like the genuine thing. But God says that we ought to know them by their fruit. We got to look at how they walk, how they talk, how they act. We got to see the real person outside of the church. Because I'm going to tell you, the devil knows how to act inside the church. But when you get outside the church, when you're at home, when you're in the dining hall, when you're shopping, do you act like a saint? Do you look like a saint? Do you are you a saint when you're there? Anything looks good inside the church. Well, yeah, yeah, we could go on a date, but a Sunday's I want you to come with me to church. And the first thing you think about, yeah, I'll go. I'll, I'll fool her. Don't know nothing about Jesus, but when they see us, there they go. Saints, the devil has his people too. Don't think that everything in the church is saved because everything ain't saved. You got folk who will come Sunday in and Sunday out. Don't bit more know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior than them drums do. But they certainly know how to sing. Glory, glory. Hallelujah. Since I laid my burden down. Ain't never laid nothing down. The only thing they laying down in is their bodies on Saturday night. And you following them. <laughs> this ain't my first walk around the park. Neither is it my first horse and pony show. Huh? 
the Apostle Paul called some names one time. He said, in this second Timothy, the second chapter, Paul says this, but shun profane and vain babbling. That's why in, 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 in Wednesday night Bible said, maybe that's why folk don't come no more, because I ain't gonna ask them stupid, I ain't gonna answer them stupid questions. <laughs> you know, questions like, well, Pastor, suppose your wife and your mama fell in the water. Neither one of them could sink. I mean swim. They probably sang while they swim. But neither one of them, who are you going to jump in and pull out the water first? What does that have to do with my Holy Ghost? What does that have to do with me trusting Jesus? If neither one of them comes out the water, I'm pretty sure they're going to heaven because both my mama and my wife are saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost. So even if I couldn't get in there and pull them out, they're going to heaven. But my, you know what my answer was to that? What would you do? Pretty soon as it gets quiet then. And pretty soon people start leaving and going home and they never come back. Bible says avoid vain babblings. Crazy stuff, the mingling the word with the world. And their word which eat as a canker of whom Hymenius and Philetus, who conquering the truth have erred, saying that the resurrection is past already and overthrow the faith of some. Can't you hear some Christians at this point? Don't judge them. You don't know their heart. That's true. It's by the outward fruit that the truth presents itself. There's a very gullible brand of Christianity that believes everything it hears just because it comes on radio, TV, or has a big congregation. Christians are children of light and should not be gullible. Did you hear what I said? A third area is church discipline. It's not wrong for the church to exercise biblical practice of church discipline. But you don't see that happening much today because the church has gotten away from being disciplined. That's why when I talked to my ministers this morning, I told them, we got to start on time. We got to get back to structure. God is a God of structure. Like I've said before, I've never seen the sun rise in the west and set in the east. Never seen it. Anybody else in here seen it? If you have, you're a liar. But God has structured the world so that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west. He's made it so that the moon goes through phases. He's made it so that we can look in the sky and know where we're at from the direction or the position of the stars. He's allowed tides to rise and fall. Everything has structure, but the church wants to get it. Well, sometimes, you know, God get out of the order of service. No, he don't. You get out of the order of service. And there comes a time when the Holy Spirit falls upon the church. But we got to know the difference. You can't force it. The reason you can tell when it's the Holy Spirit because folk will praise God. They, let me put this. I ain't for folk. Saints will praise God. Saints don't, ain't ashamed. Uh, their, their, their wig can fall off. They still praise him. Huh? I've seen it too. We fought. We. Oh, <laughs> you think the wig is speaking a language of his own? But they ain't ashamed. They praise God. I've seen men dance so, and this was before this the problem with the pants hanging out. Men praise God so hard that their pants began to fall, and they have to grab them and hold them while they still praise God. But they weren't ashamed to praise God. They were in the attitude of David when David was giving God the praise. He fell out of his coat. He wasn't ashamed. He wanna he, he just gonna praise. I'm gonna praise my God. I don't care who see him. I'm not ashamed to praise God. That's when you know it's real. That's when you know it's of God. But you got to be saved. You got to be full of the word to know the difference. We are not to be, we are not to judge motives, but we are to judge conduct. Here's an example. A policeman pulls a person over for speeding. The person in the car says, hey, hey, police officer, don't, don't judge me. You don't know my heart. You don't know what I've been going through today. The police officer patiently listens to him. And finally, the police officer says, I'm sorry, but I'm not judging your motives. I'm judging your conduct. 
I don't know what you did today. I don't know where you go. I don't, I don't know nothing about what happened before I got to this point. But I know that when I was sitting at that red light and I had my radar going, you were flying. This is a 35 mile an hour zone, but you're doing 85. So I'm, I'm, not, I'm getting you for not for what happened earlier. I'm not getting you because your wife didn't kiss you this morning. I'm not getting you because you didn't eat a good breakfast this morning. I'm getting you because you broke the law right now. That's conduct, and that's the way we judge in the church. When a person is out of line with what the Bible says that we should be, and we should be walking in the image of our Lord and Savior, we should reflect Jesus in our talk, in our walk, in our song, in our praise. And when that person is not doing it, when they're trying to make the person or all of us of us think that they're okay and their foolish ways is getting them deeper and deeper in the hot water, know that that person is not of God. They're not of God. So therefore, we have a right to look at their life at that moment. Church membership must be taken seriously and not enter into lightly. First Corinthians, the fifth chapter, says this. An outward grievous sin is publicized and it will damage the church if they don't stand against it. They are told to remove the person if he will not repent. And Paul, in verse 3, says he has already judged the matter. The church leaders have already attempted restoration using the biblical method, but the person continues to do wrong. We are to remove that person, not out of the church, but as a brother or sister in Christ. When a person commits the act of fornication, it destroys not only that person's uh, stance with God, but it destroys the church and the reputation of Jesus Christ himself. We are not to allow people to come into the church and be disruptive and cause a lot of problems in the church. We are to pull them to the side, talk to them, and if they won't hear us, get somebody else to help you. And if they won't hear the third time, they'll no longer have that position. Don't get mad with the messenger for what God has said. Recently something happened in this church. And a man sat himself down. And everybody gets mad at me like I sat him down. He knew what he was doing was wrong. But yet you get mad because that's your friend. Sin is never my friend. Anybody who commits the act of sin is not my friend. You're not my brother in the Lord. You're not nothing to me but somebody that needs prayer for and when you support people who are doing these things, you're just as guilty as the person who commits the sin. And when you keep quiet about it, you're just as guilty as the person who commits the sin. So you're just as guilty. That's why right. keep smiling. Nobody will know it's you. Okay, then what does judge not mean? Verse 3, this is an unjust, critical attitude of hypocrisy. Self-righteousness looks at what they can find to fault a person about. An overcritical attitude that manifests itself, it causes derogatory and condemning manners. These people are on permanent jury duty. Something's wrong in this church, and I'll find out what it is if it kills me. They'll start at the top. The pastor is preaching too strong a sermon against my sin. I wish he would just shut up. I wish the deacons would stop coming to my parents' house and giving them their, 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 their food, uh, their offering for the day. I wish that folk in the church would just be what I think they ought to be because that's the way I knew it when I was growing up. It's not yours. It's not, that's not the way you should think. You shouldn't be looking for something to complain about. Jesus sent messengers into Samaria to prepare for his arrival, and his messengers were rejected. What did James and John say? Lord, here's James and John now, some like folk today, when, when, when somebody do them wrong. Lord, should we call down fire from heaven and consume them? Yeah. Yeah. They wanted to judge them right then and there. Jesus replied with a rebuke saying, 
you don't know what manner of spirit they are of. They may have been right in their assumption, and perhaps Jesus knew they were right, but Jesus didn't want them assuming a wrongful place of judgment that is reserved for him and him only. This negative spirit is wrong because destructive criticism has a way of coming back on you. Did you hear what I say? Verse 2, build yourselves a reputation as a fault finder, and that's exactly how others will deal with you. Proverbs, the 26th chapter, says, Who, Whoso diggeth a pit shall fall therein, and he that rolleth a stone, it will return upon him. Here's a story. Boy found a cave, and he called out in the cave, Hello? He heard an echo and replied, Hello? Yeah, do that. He was surprised and thought there was another boy inside the cave. Who are you? Answer me. I'm going to get you. I hate you. He ran home and told his mama about the mean boy in the cave. She knew that it was an echo and said, son, why don't you go back to the cave and say something nice to the, to the boy? He went back to the cave and said, I want to be your friend. I want to be your friend. Life has a way of echoing back what we put out. What you put out is what you're going to get back. If you say people hate you and you mean to people, guess what? You ain't got no friends. But when you show yourself friendly, the Bible even says that, doesn't it? It says show yourself friendly and you will have friends. The Bible says treat everyone with kindness. It says to give and it shall be given to you. Press down, shaking together, running over. Will the Lord give back to your bosom? So what you dish out is what's going to come back. Can you say amen? A successful, wealthy contractor had a faithful carpenter who worked for him for many years. He always hoped for more money for himself or to someday become a contractor too. One day his boss came to him and said, I'm going away on another project in another state, but I want you, I want to put you in charge of a project in my absence. I want you to build me a dream house. Spare no expense. I trust your judgment. Make it as nice as you can imagine. I'll be back in a year to check it out. The young carpenter thought to himself, he said, the nerve of that guy. Pay me peanuts all these years, then insult me with the kind of leadership asking me to build him a dream house. I'll show him. He proceeded to do a shabby job with cheap materials that would fall apart in a matter of years. The contractor returned a year later and said, toss me the keys, son. Then he walked over and took the employee's hand and said, here, the house is yours. <laughs> you can build a life on a foundation of criticism if you want to. But sooner or later, you have to live in the house that you built. So if you are trying to please God, you're going to live in a way that pleases God and will let somebody around you know that you are of God. But if you do it any other way, that's what you're going to be. That's what you're going to receive. We've seen what this verse does not mean. It does not mean uh, 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 to, 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 to judge without knowing the facts. Verses 3 and 5, the hypocrite has two by four sticking out of his eye, and then we see a speck of sawdust in his brother's eye. Jesus is using sarcasm here. I'm pretty sure Jesus was laughing even as he was saying this. And I imagine everyone laughed as he was saying it. We need to start judgment with ourselves. We need to examine ourselves. We need to look at ourselves. We need to work on ourselves. What kind of church could be built if Christians would be as hard on themselves as they are on each other? Both objects were the same material. They're both with wood. The plank was wood. The speck of dust sawdust was wood. What can you, what you can so clearly see in someone else's life, you can overlook in your own life. A man wanted to impress his friends with his eye for art as they went to an art gallery together. He forgot his glasses, was nearsighted, and couldn't hardly see his hand in front of his face. He figured he could wing it with any abstract comments and observations he wanted to make. He approached the frame and began criticizing. Why 
why would anyone want to paint something so hideously ugly? I mean, it's a true rendering of the object, but why waste time with painting such a disgusting subject? Everybody broke out and started laughing. And his wife whispered in his ear, John, it's a mirror. <laughs> Judgment must begin each morning as we look into the mirror of God's word. Our time is better spent dealing with our own shortcomings, and we won't have so much time to be looking at each other and turn each other apart. Judge not that you be not judged. May God add a blessing to his word. Give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. 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 Pastor Darnell E. Whitfield is thankful that you decided to listen to today's study and invite you to come back again every Saturday and learn the truth of the Holy Bible that will bring wisdom to your life and peace to your soul. You can visit our website at lifechurchohr.org. Lifechurchohr is all one word, L-I-F-E-C-H-U-R-C-H-O-H-R dot O-R-G. You can join our Lessons for Life blog, which comes out every Wednesday, by sending us your email address to lifechurchhr at outlet.com. LifeChurchHR at Outlook.com. Friends, please help our ministry to continue the work of pointing people to Christ and serving our community with a donation of $10 or more through the church's PayPal account, or you can send your checks to our business suite at Life Church of Hampton Roads, 4240 Portsmouth Boulevard, Suite 433. Chesapeake, Virginia, 23321.